Hello there. Welcome to Just the Dis. My name is Brian, and we talk about Blu rays here. And today I'm going to talk about a recent round of seven films titles. Um, and I've got some pairings. So I'm going to tell you about the movies. I'm going to talk about the features briefly, and then I have some movies that you could pair with them. They wouldn't be necessarily straight double bills, but they could go with the movie in some way, or I'm pairing it with some element that might work. It's something we do on Pure Cinema all the time. So, let's get into this. <clears throat> First, we have Nosferatu in Venice, which is from 1988, and uh, this was going to be, I guess, an unofficial sequel to the... Uh, Nosferatu the Vampire um, original film directed by uh, Werner Herzog but it just turned into sort of a runaway nightmare production apparently and had something like four or five directors and Klaus was pretty nuts on this one I uh, have heard um, but it's got a really interesting supporting cast uh, including Christopher Christopher Plummer and uh, Donald Pleasance, and uh, it's an interesting film. I gotta say, I, I wasn't sure what to expect from it. Uh, it also has a Vangelis score, so you know they did the music for Blade Runner, and uh, I think Chariots of Fire and others. They have a specific kind of sound, and this is a uh, adding choral elements into that, uh, and I, and it works. And Klaus is very good as you know this vampire, like he kind of feels <laughs> he doesn't feel human in a way so that kind of works um but that said uh it was interesting because the print on the movie says uh, vampires in venice which is just a little aside but the actual klaus character doesn't show up until about 20 minutes in and the movie has more of an art film approach than i expected um Here's the back, just so you can see it. It's an all-region disc, by the way. Um, so, yeah, more of an art film approach. And, you know, maybe some of that has to do with having four directors and trying to stitch together a coherent vision. You know, I'm not really sure. Uh, that Van Gellis score is very ethereal, and that, that always helps me. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it's interesting. And... I did find it intriguing that Christopher Plummer is kind of, he's not necessarily the lead over Klaus. He certainly doesn't overshadow Klaus in terms of his presence in this film, but he shows up in Venice and he sort of gets caught up in this mystery of this Nosferatu vampire and how he was believed to have left Venice 200 years ago, but Plummer is sort of, trying to figure out some clues as to, you know, is he still here or was he here or, or you know, has he been resurrected? That kind of thing. Um, but it becomes kind of Christopher Plummer's movie for a little while. And then we get these scenes of Klaus sort of wandering Venice in the fog. And uh, there's a lot of, um, he has a, a thirst for blood and sex, I think they say on the back here. Um, but yeah, no, it's an intriguing film. Uh, but that said, I think the big draw for me on this disc is there is a supplement, which is, you know, a pretty big one. It's called Creation is Violent. It's a new feature length documentary on Klaus Kinski's final years. I want to say it's like 82 minutes long. So, you know, a full length movie. And that is fascinating. You know, I know there's some folks out there that have probably seen My Best Fiend and are familiar with how you know, problematic Klaus could be on set and how, you know, antagonistic his relationship was with Werner Herzog, but it's clear that he just hated directors. And so, you know, there's a lot of people that he he didn't work well with in terms of directors. And so they, in that documentary, they talked to some co-stars, directors, uh, that he worked with, they focus a little bit on uh, Crawl Space, the movie Crawl Space, and the movie Creature. Um, David Schmoller directed Crawl Space, and he is not shy about how much of a nightmare Klaus was in that movie. Um, so it's really interesting to hear his stories. He actually made like a little video about it prior to this that they show footage of, and um, there's lots of great 
like Klaus quotes peppered through the documentary, like making movies is better than cleaning toilets and the ultimate acting is to, to destroy yourself. Um, there are a ton of them. I tried to write a few more down, but I was totally sucked into that documentary. And I think this disc is worth picking up for that alone. Um, but so that is, uh, Nosferatu in Venice. And then, like I said, I'm going to offer some, some pairings here to go with this movie in different capacities. So, like I said, art house vampire movie. I'm going to recommend Night Owl. This is a Vinegar Syndrome title. Um, you know, sort of a post-punk vampire movie. Uh, black and white, gritty. Um, that's kind of the vibe that you get. It's like, it says an ode to East Village sleaze. Um, so this one's a little more, more modern, even than uh, Nosferatu in Venice, which is set, I guess, ostensibly in the modern day. But if you like a sort of a gritty, low-budget, arty vampire film, uh, I think Night Owl is a good choice to go with it. Um, this one might still be available on their website and could be picked up during the halfway to Black Friday flash pre-order, which I would recommend because it'll probably be pretty cheap and uh, worth discovering. So that's one. And I mean, if we're talking art house vampire, you know, you can't not at least mention The Hunger. Um, I think it works interestingly as a pairing with this, Tony Scott's film. Uh, they both have, like I said, that sort of art house approach. Tony, Tony uh, is always, Tony Scott is always very stylish and this movie is one of his more stylish films and um, a great, you know, vampire movie in a lot of ways. So that's another one you could think about. I'm not going to go deep on that one. And even more art house vampires, we have uh, Abel Ferrar's The Addiction with Lily Taylor, Christopher Walken, Annabella Sciorra. Um, no, it's interesting. They're talking about the mid-90s being a fertile period for vampire movies. It says big-name stars such as Tom Cruise and Eddie Murphy flocked to the genre, as did high-caliber filmmakers like Francis Ford Coppola, Wes Craven, John Landis, uh, and Independence. Um, Abel Ferrara reunited with his King of New York star Christopher Walken for The Addiction, a distinctly personal take on The Creatures of the Night. And it deals with uh, Lily Taylor as a philosophy student, who um, on her way home from class is bitten and you know she falls ill and then realizes that it's not an ordinary sickness and uh, Walken becomes involved. I don't want to give away too much. This is one that I really think is best enjoyed knowing the l least you can, um, but it's definitely one of Abel Ferrar's best movies. I'll put it right there. Uh, and this is a nice uh, Region A Arrow Blu-ray. So I do think the addiction might work well with Nosferatu in Venice. And then because, like I said, the Christopher Plummer thing, um, he becomes like the main character and he's investigating and it's, you know, foggy European backgrounds. For some reason, Murder by Decree, Bob Clark's Murder by Decree came into my head as a possible pairing because it is, like I said, just a Christopher Plummer movie as much as Nosferatu in Venice kind of is. So I think this could also work as a pairing and this is highly recommended it's a great um Sherlock Holmes tale with Christopher Plummer as Holmes and James Mason as Watson and then you have like this really stacked cast David Henning Hemmings Susan Clark um John Gilgood Donald Sutherland and jean vievre Bougeau um and it's really a gritty uh Holmes mystery you know like it's Holmes versus Jack the Ripper basically so that's kind of the story that you're dealing with here but anyway I thought that might also work as a pairing with that one. Next up, we have another <clears throat> of the Severn titles. This is A Scream in the Streets. And um, this one, this one's pretty unique. I got to put it like that. Uh, it's a worldwide Blu-ray premiere, and it says, of the ultimate in 670s sexploitation. And it says, from infamous producer Harry Novak, whose box office international pictures brought the world such classics as Axe, Mantis and Lace, and Wham Bam, Thank You Spaceman comes the still startling, uh, 
sicky about a pair of LAPD detectives hunting a transvestite psychopath through a polyester jungle of massage parlors, par, massage parlor perverts, suburban sex fiends, violence crazed cops, and one of the worst examples of cross dressing ever filmed. Um, you know, so that said, I, um, I kind of went in with lower expectations on this one and I didn't fully expect what it is, which is, you know, just a notch below hardcore pornography, you know, in terms of it has a plot, you know, this sort of city under siege by this serial rapist, murderer, cross-dresser guy, and that plot plays itself out, but they will break for these long, involved sex scenes that are not quite hardcore, but they're they're definitely um, just on the edge. So that was a little bit of a surprise. I, I thought I was getting more of a... I knew it was going to be sleazy, but I didn't know that's where it was going. So, you know, be prepared for that. That said, this movie surprised me because I really thought that it I mean it's definitely sleazy and feels low budget but it has some energy and some really enjoyable dialogue in parts you know stuff that's like kind of clever in spite of the kind of movie it is um, I've heard it called a sleazed up soft core Adam 12 episode I don't think that's fully fair I think it's a little better than that um, but yeah, this one kind of surprised me. Like, despite everything, those clever dialogue exchanges between the cops and, you know, some of the ladies in the film, I, I ultimately found them kind of endearing. So this one was a little bit of a low level discovery for me. Um, and this has, uh, two sexy shorts produced from a scream in the streets outtakes uh, and then trailers. It doesn't have much in the way of features. Um, did I forget? You know what? I might have forgot. This also has um, creation is violent outtakes and um, gypsies, gypsies should be played by real gypsies. Nothing bad can happen. Some other featurettes that I forgot to mention. I mean, the creation uh, is violent. The feature length Kinski doc is the draw, but I, for, I wanted to mention everything. Anyway, so... Screaming the streets. Um, yeah, it was. There was just moments in it where I was like, "Oh, that's pretty funny," or that, you know, bit of dialogue is more clever than I expected, and it just it kind of charmed me in a way that I didn't fully think was going to happen. So, um, definitely sleazy, definitely low budget, and kind of silly in parts, but definitely interesting. So, that's a screaming the streets. In terms of pairings, interestingly. <clears throat> This came to mind. The Police Connection, a.k.a. The Mad Bomber, which is a Quentin Tarantino favorite. He's programmed it uh, at least once, maybe twice, at the New Beverly Theater in Los Angeles. And I know he's a big, big fan of it. And I get it. It's it's a very interesting movie. I'm maybe not a big, big fan, but he definitely likes things about it. Um, so it has Vince Edwards as this cop who's trying to stop a Mad Bomber, played by Chuck Connors who is really big in terms of his performance in this film. Uh, and the only person that has witnessed the Mad Bomber and seen his face and can help the cops is a serial rapist played by Neville Brand. And Neville Brand is like the strongest performance in the film. And it's a pretty abhorrent character, to say the least, but he's very good at it. Like He, he plays this kind of scumbag really well. Um, but what it is to me though, is it's both scream in the streets and, um, mad bomber are lower budget LA cop movies, right? So they show Los Angeles. I think they both came out in 1973. That's the other thing I thought was neat. So they show Los Angeles circa 1973, you know, not very production designed really. It's, these are lower budget films, so they're not doing that. Um, and it just gave me Scream in the Streets kind of gave me a similar vibe to some of the cop stuff in in uh, The Mad Bomber. Uh, it just, I don't know, the feel and the energy and the dialogue and the setting and the sleaze of it. You know, obviously this isn't as sleazy as that, but it, it kind of 
I don't know, just lined up. I was like, oh, this feels like it should play as a double bill with the Mad Bomber or the Mad Bomber should play and then a Scream in the Street should, should play. I don't know. But I thought this would be a good one to go with that. Uh, I, I'm not sure if this um, Code Red Blu-ray is still in print. I think you can still get it. Uh, but I would also look for maybe a potential reissue through Kino Lorber as they seem to be doing that with a lot of uh, Code Red titles these days. So that's one recommendation. Any other? I got to go with Vice Squad. You know, another sleazy Los Angeles movie. You've got a killer pimp played by the great Wings Hauser, uh, also starring Season Hubley and Gary Swanson. And he is a super awful terminator of a force of nature. And it's one of Wings' maybe his probably his best performance, really. Uh, but it's a Gary Sherman film, and I'm a big fan of Gary Sherman as a director. And yeah, this one is just very much the seedy underbelly of Los Angeles. And so it feels like of a piece with something like a scream in the streets, you know, obviously this is almost 10 years later, but you know, there's just, and it's a little, it feels like a more like a higher budget production, not high budget by any means, but higher budget in terms of the quality of the acting in terms of the quality of the filmmaking. It's just Gary Sherman's very sharp. So anyway, I just thought this might play interestingly with, uh, Screaming the Streets. So Vice Squad is another one I recommend for that. And then we have the 4Ks. I'm going to start with Perdita Durango. This is from 1999. This is the slip. I'll take it out of the slip. So you can see this stars Rosie Perez and Javier Bardem. And uh, she plays Perdita Durango, the uh, the main character in question. And for those that don't know, <clears throat> Perdita Durango is actually sort of a spin-off character from Wild at Heart. Now she's not, I don't think she ended up in the movie version, but she's in um, the written version that was done uh, by Barry Gifford, who also wrote this. Um, I mean, he wrote the books and, it's, and he wrote the script. And anyway, so you can definitely, if I was going to pair something, you could definitely pair it with Wild at Heart. That definitely works. But <clears throat> it's it's a little different than that. It's a little more, um, I don't know if edgy is the right word because Wild at Heart's pretty edgy. But uh, I just, I guess I found it to be like, my pitch would be true, true romance in a lower key desperado adjacent kind of world you know incredibly violent almost off-puttingly so in spots in terms of the characters because um you know Javier Bardem is just really he's pretty despicable um and so is Perdita in a lot of ways but Javier is just like sadistic in this movie I mean he's great you know you're seeing it's one of those movies where I'm kind of like how did I not see this I, I knew about it um, Elric had mentioned it to me, but, uh, somehow it had passed me by. And so it was really nice to get to see it for the first time in this 4k. The back here says 97, but I thought I saw it was in 99. Um, so forgive me if I got the date wrong there, but, um, looks really good in this 4k. This is one of the two first 4k releases from seven films and they come out of the gate very strong in terms of the overall package and the transfers look good. Um, so this one, uh, I would just add a few notes about it. Uh, it has James Gandolfini crossover with, you know, true romance. It's not the same character. He plays like an FBI agent or something in this, but I do like the true romance and this movie, um, made not that far apart. Both have Gandolfini in them. Uh, also it has Screaming Jay Hawkins, and he imply uh, he supplies a very important song in the film, which I'm not going to talk about because uh, I don't. I'll let you guys experience that. And also, interestingly, uh, Alex Cox plays one of the cop fed dudes, and so it's kind of cool to see Alex Cox putting on an American accent and working with Gandolfini and Gandolfini like hating him, and that's a fun dynamic in and of itself. But um, the romance itself is really neat because it it really plays like 
the way Javier Bardem approaches her and the way they hit it off, you totally buy it and you buy into that relationship. And, uh, you, you know, even when Javier Bardem, there's moments where he has his face painted red and he's looking like Mola Ram in Temple of Doom or like Diane Ladd in Wild at Heart or something. Even then, like you can see, like he's very true to himself and, and she just really cares about him. Like she, she, this is the only guy that she's been able to connect with. It's one of those kind of movies. It definitely has some heavy noir bo- vibes to it and fatalism, you know, uh, it's, de- it's got, you know, the, the dark comedic aspect, but it does go real dark into dramatic places too, which, you know, is an interesting ride. Um, so in terms of supplements, uh, this has an interview with director Alex De La Iglesia and writing Perdita Durango, an interview with writer Barry Gifford, who, as I said, wrote Wild at Heart. And the director interview is 28 minutes. The, <clears throat> the Barry Gifford interview is 17 minutes. And the Gifford one is pretty cool because he's talking about you know writing Wild at Heart and how he comes up with the Perita Durango character and how she like tri- threatened to take over the book. It was such a strong character that he had to sort of suppress her a bit in the Wild at Heart book uh, and realize that the next book was going to be her book. Like it was all about her. And so, you know, he, he, he goes into a lot of that stuff. And he talks about writing scripts versus books and adaptations and characters. It's, it's really good. Like I like to hear him talk a lot. He just seems like a good, cool dude. Um, this also has Rebecca McKendry, uh, on the disc. This is a 13 minute, uh, like it's a very nice appreciation and context. And she even talks about the real woman that Perdita may have been sort of based on, but she talks about how much she likes the director and, uh, she's great. Like I always love a a nice uh, feature with her in it. So that's a very much a plus. And uh, then there is an interview with Abraham Castillo Flores and Calder of Blood author Jim Schultz. Uh, and, and that talks also, it's called uh, Narcos Satanicos, Perdita Durango and the Matt Matamoros cult. So again, talking about the potential real life roots of a woman in a cult that may have sort of influenced this character And that's fascinating real crime stuff. So I dug that too. Um, And then there's an interview with the composer and an interview with the DP as well. So they really went all around in terms of the uh, features on this. This is an uh, all-region disc, uh, the Blu-ray. All the features are on the Blu-ray, really, I think. Um, And, uh, yeah, it's just a a really solid sort of Bonnie and Clyde-y kind of thing. But like I said, darker and edgier than just about any of that type of film that I've ever seen. But, you know, I've loved seeing Rosie Perez, you know, show up in like Birds of Prey and, and, you know, TV and movies lately. And here she is still in her prime. And I think she's not out of it really. uh, But in that 90s, uh, really hot area where she was just all over everything in the best way. It was just great to see her, you know, given a big juicy character like this to chew on and she just absolutely kills it she's for me the best part of the movie you know Javier Bardem is great but that character is a little tough so if I'm being honest uh she wins but anyway very cool as this being one of the first uh 4ks from Severin so that's Perdita Durango now as I said it has some noir elements So I'm going to bring in some noir stuff to pair with it. Uh, I think 52 Pickup would work. This is um, one that I've talked about on the podcast with my friend uh, Brendan Small. And uh, it's one of the best canon produced films, I think. It is uh, written by uh, Elmore Leonard based on his book. And... uh, it is directed by John Frankenheimer. So, you know, that's quality stuff right there. But yeah, it's just a really dark story about this guy uh, and his wife. That's Scheider and Anne-Margaret. 
and how they get sort of tangled up. Well, Roy Scheider does and in, in turn Anne Margaret does with some really scummy dudes, like some really dark dudes, some pornographers and just people that are not nice, very bad guys, let's say. I think that's part of the reason it lined up for me with Perdita is there are some very bad people in Perdita in terms of what they do to people and the carnage they leave in their wake and the kind of people that they are up against feels like, you know, it could be the kind of people that, you know, Scheider goes up against in this. This is a little bit more subdued. It's not, this this is like kind of wild and stylish and crazy, frenetic. This isn't quite that, but it's really well done. And uh, anyway, I just like the darkness of the noir characters in it seem to resonate. So that's one. Another one I like, uh, Kill Me Again. This is uh, John Dahl's film. I think he did it before Red Rock West. But Red Rock West would be great too. That's just not on Blu-ray that I know of uh, in the States. Um, but yeah, this one's sort of like a uh, down-on-his-luck P.I. played by Val Kilmer gets roped into uh, a scheme, a uh, femme fatale scheme with Joanne Wally Kilmer. I don't think they were married at the time. I can't remember. And Michael Madsen and things get dark again very seriously bad people that you're dealing with in that in this film as well and i think that is the connector for me is the noir and the villains who are just like they don't care they're gonna (laughs) they will kill you as, as soon as look at you and you know if you have any way to get them a big sum of money you are even more in the way uh and and dispensable so I won't go too deep on the plot of this one, but uh, I'm a big fan of it. I think it's really solid and it has a good supporting cast with, you know, Jonathan Grice and, uh, or Jonathan Grice. And um, I feel like there's a couple others I recognized in here and I can't remember right now, but Kill Me Again is a good noir to go with Perdita. <clears throat> More on the wild side. Uh, Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. Um, this this plays up the sort of more comedic side of Perdita, which it has. Again, it dips into dark, dramatic territory, but it has moments that are more comedic and, and dark in that way. And um, this one is, as you can see, Mickey Rourke and Don Johnson. And they are... Um, it says this is a four-lane genre collision of biker movie, heist thriller, buddy flick, and sci-fi pick. Uh and it says, uh, when their favorite bar is threatened with closure, outlaw biker Harley, Mickey Rourke, and modern-day cowboy Marlboro, Don Johnson, hatch a scheme to save the day by robbing the corrupt bank behind the, the bar's shutdown. Uh, when the robbery yields not money but a shipment of drugs, Harley and Marlboro find themselves on the run from the bank's sinister president, Tom Sizemore, and a posse of seemingly unstoppable hitmen. So that's another thing this has, is a lot of bad people bad hit people, killers. Um, and so it, I don't know, again, universes that feel like they might line up a little bit. I think that, uh, Harley Davidson, the Marvel man could be one that you could watch with Perdita and enjoy. And lastly, this one plays more to the dramatic side of things. And it's another Severin title, the boys next door, Penelope Spheris's film from 1984, uh, about, you know, two sociopaths or, one borderline sociopath and his seriously sociopathic friend, uh, played by Maxwell Caulfield uh, and Charlie Sheen, uh, and how they take a trip to L.A. and get themselves in all kinds of trouble. And, yeah, things go bad. And, again, that noir fatalism applies here. There is some comedy to it in parts uh, amidst the darkness. Uh, I'm, a, I'm like, I'm a big fan of this would be sounding a little odd, but I I definitely think this is a solid film and one that I had underappreciated until I saw it on this Blu-ray from Severin. And um, this definitely opened my eyes to the film a bit more, but I do think it could work also with Perdita Durango. So, Boys Next Door. So a bunch of recommendations for that one. Sorry for all that. And then uh, lastly, in terms of the 4Ks, uh, as I said, we have this, and then we have... Day of the Beast, also by Alex de la Iglesia. So that is your slip. Here's your inside cover. And um, 
I'm not going to get myself in trouble there. Restored on Blu-ray for the first time ever in America. So this one's interesting. Um, it is one I definitely had heard about for years and had never seen. Uh, it says, uh, in between his cult hit debut, uh, Axion Mutante and proudly depraved Perdita Durango, writer-director Alex de la Iglesia, uh, delivered the international smash that remains one of the best horror comedies of our time when a rogue priest discovers the exact date that the Antichrist will be born. He will enlist a death metal record store clerk, a cheesy TV psychic, uh, for an urban spree of gore, sacrilege, and twisted humor to prevent the apocalypse by summoning Satan himself. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. So, yeah, you have a priest who decides he needs to su summon Satan. How does he do that? He starts sinning like crazy, doing bad things, uh, hurting people, and, you know, going to a heavy metal record shop to talk to this guy about which albums might have messages to Satan and, you know, kidnapping people and talking to this TV psychic about, you know, what do we need to, to summon him? You know, you need virgin blood, you know, stuff like that. Um, so it is very interestingly pitched in terms of the comedy and the horror aspects of it. And it does kind of go there, if you will, by the end, which I do respect. Um, but uh, yeah, very interesting film for sure. And I'm trying to think what else. It has a really nice um, making of. And uh, let's see here. I was looking for my notes there. But um, it has Heirs of the Beast, a feature length making of documentary, another great you know, documentary feature where you, you're getting like that sort of, you know, bonus, if you will, with the movie, which I think is really cool when they include something that epic, um, with it. So you have that, which is good. And then you have Antichrist Superstar, an interview with the director again for this one, the man who saved the world, an interview with actor Armando De Raza, uh, who plays the, uh, priest, I believe in this, um, Oh, no, I'm sorry, he's not. Uh, he is the TV psychic, my bad. Um, who's very good, by the way. He's very funny. Um, and then it says, The Man Who Saved the World, interview with actor Armando. Uh, nope, that's the TV psychic. And then Beauty and the Beast, interview with actress Maria Grazia Cucinata. Uh, Shooting the Beast, interview with director of photography Flavio Martinez Labiano. And... Uh, Mirindas Asenen, Asesinas, uh, a short uh, by uh, Alex de la Iglesias. So you get a whole bunch of stuff on this uh, package. And again, really well put together by Severin. Great looking transfer for this movie. I mean, I've never seen it before, but I was just kind of like, wow, this looks just fantastic. Looks so good uh, on 4K. So showing good sort of signs about what's to come, you know, for future. I know they have Santa Sangre coming in 4K, and maybe there's a couple others that have been announced that I missed, but um, definitely look forward to any 4K releases that Severin is doing from this point. Um, but these two are really a strong start, and definitely an interesting film this one is for sure. Um, in terms of pairings, this one was a little harder because it is sort of so specific, you know, with this priest um trying to summon the devil and you know i i mean it it definitely brought to mind a couple different movies but um i mean one of the big ones i couldn't help but bring in is the gate because you have in this in this case it's obviously a different group of people you have kids in this one as opposed to a priest and a metalhead and you know i don't know it's so it's a different group of people summoning demons um but it felt like it could play, you know, in terms of the, there is a sort of a comedy aspect to this a little bit. Um, the effects are more prominent in the gate and better in some ways, but there are some interesting effects in day of the beast as well. So, uh, I thought the gate might play as a double with day of the beast. And then another one I've only discovered recently, uh, night visitor. Um, and this is a scorpion blu-ray. Uh, about 
it's basically I've I've talked about it on the channel before. It's basically like Fright Night with a uh, devil worshiper. This kid, you know, sees some kind of ritual killing happening at his neighbor's house, and it turns out that his neighbor is is history teacher played by um, Alan Garfield, who he then accuses and it sort of falls flat. And then he has to deal with this demon worshiping history teacher. I think he's history, um, just harassing him in class. And it's just, anyway, it's cheesy sort of eighties, but I, I totally dug it. It also has Elliot Gould showing up in the third act and Michael J. Pollard is like, um, Alan Garfield's assistant. And it's just, it's bizarre and fun and very Satan-y if you will. Uh, so I thought that could work, uh, as a fun follow up to Day of the Beast as well. Anyway, those are the new Severn titles I got. Uh, definitely worth checking out and then some pairings to go with them. Hopefully uh, there is some interesting stuff in here for you to watch or to give you context, give you an idea of the kind of movie that I responded to and how that reflected in the pairings that I brought to this video. Um, so uh, let me know if you picked up these Severn films, Blu-rays or 4Ks and what you thought, or if you have any other Severn uh, purchases that you're excited about. Like I'm excited about the Andy Milligan set, which is coming very soon. And I hope to have in the coming weeks to talk about on the channel at some point, you know, excited relative, but I'm, I actually, no, I am. I like, like I was for the, the Adamson set. I really think it's going to be a great, presentation of a uh, filmmaker and his career. You know, I really like that idea of just being able to sit down and go, who was this guy? And look at a box like that and kind of get a sense of that person all in one place. I just think it's super cool and not easy to do. So hats off to Severin for cranking on the box sets like that one as well. Uh, anyway, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe if you are enjoying what I'm doing. And uh, I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.